And all right, we're here in Genesis chapter number 28. Of course, it's good to have uh, pre-knowledge of the, of the previous chapters. And specifically, that is that uh, the story that w w about, I believe, three chapters back, I believe it's chapter number 25, is where Esau uh, supplanted or Jacob supplanted Esau for his birthright. Well, we just finished reading in Genesis chapter number 27, there at the very end, how Jacob again supplanted Esau and this time for the blessing. That is the context of where we're going to pick up here in verse number one. He's actually in the middle of blessing Jacob still. Look at Genesis chapter number 28. Look at verse number one with me. It says this, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, <clears throat> Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, verse 2, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Now, if we back up to Genesis chapter number 27, we see the exact same commandment that is given, but yet this time it is from his mother. Look at chapter number 27, verse number 46. It says, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are, are, are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Now there she's speaking of Isaac. Of course, this is why Isaac charged uh, specifically Jacob to not take of the daughters of Heth or Canaan. We know that those that were of the land of Canaan were wicked. They were evil pagans. They were not serving the Lord. That is the reason why we get to chapter number 28. And Isaac commands Jacob not to take a wife of the land there. And this is important, of course. I kind of hit on it uh, in the previous chapter, so I don't want to just go over the same things repeatedly. But it's important that our children marry other believers. It's important that we, we make sure. This, this should not be an option. This should not be, I hope. You know, notice what he says in verse number one. It says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Look, look what it says. And charged him. What does that mean? That's like an order. That's basically what that means. It says, and charged him. I don't care how old my children are. If they're in my house, they're going to be under my rule. They're going to be under my orders. And when my children are living in my house and they're wanting to know, hey, can I, can I marry this guy or can I marry this girl? I will command them that they are only allowed to marry believers. I will command and charge them that they are only allowed to marry believers. Hey, I can't force them if they just want to want to just leave and go, right? Of course, when Jacob left, he could have just uh, went out outside of his father's will and married in with a heathen, couldn't he have? But while they're under my rule and they're living in my house, I will charge my children, I will command my children that they must marry. If it's my daughter, she will marry a faithful man who is a believer. If it is my son, he will marry a faithful woman that is a believer. This is not an option. This should be a commandment. Parents need to be more assertive nowadays. We shouldn't have this attitude like just let kids, you know, parent themselves. Let kids govern themselves. The Bible says that, a, that a, in a child's heart is foolishness. That a child's heart is foot filled with foolishness. We shouldn't allow a child just to make up, you know, uh, what he believes. Just to allow a child just to go the path that he wants to go. Just allow a child just to believe the things that he wants to believe. We are there, we are put there as a parent and as a guardian by God entrusted with this important job and responsibility to raise our children up in the law of God, to raise our children up in the Word of God. We should be assertive with this. We should command our children. We should expect nothing but what the Bible expects from them. And we, in this, this, this type of parenting today, of course, of just hands-off, just allow them to go where they want to be. Oh, my son, he's, he's three years old and he told me that he want, he's a girl. He said he's not a boy. You know, he said that he's a girl. That is so stupid. Th these people have to honestly be kidding themselves. They have to realize that what they are saying. There's no way that I, tr that I believe that in their hearts they honestly think that this is reality. That their son really is. And, 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 you, know, uh, and you know, people are whacked out. You don't know what people believe nowadays. But you know, even still, the point stands. We need to stand up and we need to tell our children you know, what they need to be doing, that they need to be reading their Bible, that they need to be marrying in with other believers. This should not be an option. This should be a commandment. <clears throat> uh, we need to take it very serious as a parent. Look at verse number 2 again. Arise, go to Padanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, 
thy mother's brother. And of course, this was referred to as Mesopotamia is where this is, is located. Uh, they, he, specifically, it was the land of Nahor was where they had went before, where the servant had taken Rebekah from for Isaac. Look at verse number 3. It says this, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. Verse number 4, And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. And of course, the full fulfillment of this promise is found in the gospel. This is given to the seed which is Christ. And the seed is multiplied. It is. And there's a, a great number that's standing in heaven in Revelation chapter number 7 where we see this being fulfilled. So it's always good to remind yourself each time when you read this and allow the New Testament to interpret these passages for you because the Old Testament can be a little bit difficult without having you know uh, specific details that are given. So that's why the New Testament is there to be a commentary to the Old Testament. Another thing that's interesting in there in verse number 3, it says, And God Almighty bless thee. Now, who's speaking right now? <clears throat> who's talking? It would be Isaac, correct? It's Isaac, and he is charging his son Jacob, right? Well, if you go back to Genesis chapter number 17, Genesis chapter number 17, it says this, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So notice what title or what name did he give unto himself? God. The Almighty God or God Almighty, right? When you flip forward to Genesis chapter number 28, verse number 3, we have uh, Isaac speaking. Now this is Abraham's son and what does he refer to God as? God Almighty. Where did he get this from? God himself, right? And from his father. Of course, number one, we can see it being passed down from generation to generation. Abraham raising up his children and teaching them the word of God. But not only that, this is the title that God wants to be referred to as, right? And what does Isaac do? This is important. He refers to him by a title or by a name that God called himself or that obviously God wants to be referred to as. We should refer to God by titles or by names that he wants. We should refer to God in ways in which the Bible refers to God. Uh, recently, somebody said to me about the Jesus is Jehovah sermon that I'm doing. Why are you, why are you say, calling it Jesus is Jehovah? You'll just confuse people. No, 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 that's God's name. That's the Bible calls him Jehovah. So what you're doing by not using and, and, and purposely attempting to you know, prevent the name of Jehovah from going out there, you're causing an ignorance in the mind of the person uh, that would probably want to learn the Word of God, what you're doing. There's a deeper knowledge there. When God calls himself Lord, we should refer to him as Lord. When God refers to himself as Jehovah, we should call him Jehovah. When God's name is now revealed as Jesus, you know what we should refer to him as? Jesus. That's what we should call him as. So people, you know, we don't, I, I don't want some other source. I don't want, you know, some outside text or some alternative method of finding out who God... I want the Bible, I want God's Word to tell me what I should call God. And I'm going to call God what God wants me to call Him. If God calls Himself God Almighty, I'm going to call Him God Almighty. If God refers to Himself as Jehovah, I'm going to call Him Jehovah. If He says my name is Lord, guess what I'm going to call Him? Lord. The New Testament calls God Jesus. So you know what I refer to him as? Jesus. We should refer to God by names, by things that God is. You know what else falls perfectly into this category? And I haven't beaten this thing in a long time. God is not referred to one time in the Bible as persons, ever. I will never call God three persons because God never calls himself three persons. And not only that, God calls himself a person. The, the, the words of the Bible, this is God's word. So the things that are spoken by prophets, when the Holy Spirit is moving them and causing them to write inspired scripture, that's what God wants to be written down, right? So when God, you see scripture saying, hey, God, and then in some way or another, a person. Do you know what God wants you to call him? A person. Stop calling God things that he doesn't say to call him. Stop trying to, to find these philosophical terms that will try to describe the way that you think of God in your mind. Why not just go to the scripture? Because you know what will happen if you do that? You'll come up with a misunderstanding. That's what will happen. Because you'll take these other words that have all of these definitions and ideas and connotations that are attached to them and you'll start using those words 
And then you'll start coming up with a misunderstanding of who God is. You'll start having a misunderstanding of what God is and how he has revealed himself and what his nature is. Don't call God a persons. Call God a person. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And even in context, people always, they want to take you to 1 John 5, 7. That's like, it's like it's definitive proof that, hey, they are three persons. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are bearing record of the Son of God. And do you know what they always want to make? The Word? The second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. No, that is not what that is talking about. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, are bearing record of the Son of God. Which is why the Son of God says in the book of John, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Don't tell me that the Word is this person. He says specifically that it is the Scriptures. Now, I would agree that the Word is a person in the sense that the Word is God, but there's one God, and He's one person. So guess what we're back to? Square one. One God, one person. Amen. And His Word's a person. Yes, I agree with it, but guess what? It's God. That's why. Not a second person than God. It's one God. I mean, this is not a difficult concept. Now, if you have verses in the Bible that may seem to teach that God is persons, well, then you need to reevaluate your understanding of those scriptures. You need to reevaluate, because we don't have these two contradictory ideas in the Bible. That's not what is going on in the Bible. We have very clear teachings that God is a person. He refers to himself in singularity, repeatedly, all throughout the Old Testament. People want to blow this off, but this is super significant. Here's the thing. We never, we never one time, pre-incarnation, we never one time see a discussion between the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Where, where, where the Father and the Son are talking, the Father, the Holy Ghost are talking, it doesn't exist. It, in the entire, let this sink in for a second, in the entire Old Testament, it does not exist. Are you serious? Until the incarnation. Until he's growing with wisdom. Until he's growing in stature. Until he's a man in a fullest capacity in a genuine way. A full, in, in every way is fully a man. Now wouldn't you expect there to be a conversation between God fully and in every way as a man, assuming the mind of a man, in a genuine, real way, becoming a man, have an identity, Jesus of Nazareth, he now has a God. Like it says in Psalm chapter number 22, Brother Russell and I were talking about this the other day. He says this, and that's Jesus, a prophecy of Jesus. He says, thou art my God from my mother's womb. From when? From my mother's womb. Why would it say that? Because it's the man. Because it's, it's God being born as a man. From when? From my mother's womb. Because that's when he took on this new identity. God as a man. You say that's confusing. Great is the mystery of godliness. You know what advice I give you if it's confusing? Study the Bible more and I am sure God will reveal, your, uh, reveal it to your understanding deeper and deeper. Because God wants you to know who he is. Here's the thing. Here, this is what we take away from Genesis chapter 28 verse 3. Call God things that he says to call him. Call him God Almighty. Call him Jehovah. Call him Jesus. Call him Lord. Call him names that he wants you to call him, right? The New Testament, we should be referring to him as Jesus, right? Primarily. But you know what else? Don't call him things and describe him in ways in which not, is not biblical, right? We need to call him things that the Bible calls him. Speak as of the oracles of God, like the Bible says, right? Person, not persons. It's not biblical. Amen. Look at verse 4. <clears throat> And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. And you see the great faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This promise is given to Abraham that he's going to inherit this land. Abraham dies and he doesn't get it while he's alive, right? Because the promise is to come later. New Jerusalem, of course. Isaac has the promise, but does Isaac <coughs> inherit the land? Hebrews 11 tells you he doesn't. Hebrew, uh, Acts 7 tell you, tells you he doesn't while he's on this earth. They, it says they were pilgrims and strangers on the earth. It says they were, they were sojourning in a land that wasn't there. It says that while Abraham was alive, that God didn't give him any land. And it says not so much as to set his foot on. None. None. But do you know what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all still believed the message that God was preaching to them, the gospel. Because it was to come in the future. The seed was to come in the future, and this promise was to come in the future. It was fulfilled in, it's going to be fulfilled, of course, in the new Jerusalem. 
is what it's going to be. So you see the, the great faith that Jacob, even after Abraham and Isaac died, and this promise was given to them, Jacob still believes God, doesn't he? Look at verse 5. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, <coughs> excuse me, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. Now, there's a couple of things we can learn from that. Number one, we can see that Esau is a man that does want to obey his mother and his father, isn't he? Now, number two, we, this is very powerful. It's something we've somewhat uh, spoke about recently, is the provocation of one man to the next. Now, what's the reason why Esau, in this case, wanted to do that which was pleasing unto, or what provoked Esau to do that which was ple pleasing unto his parents? Because Jacob did it. Look at it again. It says in verse 6, When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent away to Padanaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And then verse 7 it says, And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padanaram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then it says, Then he went and he took unto him th this wife. Right? So what was one of the reasons why he did it? Now, of course it was that his fa it wasn't pleasing to his father and his mother, but number two, it was also what? That Jacob obeyed his father and his mother. So that's, this, is an important, this is an important tip. Let's say this first. Let's use the primary application, the, 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 ap the strict application of the text. Children, it's important, especially children, listen, especially the older children in families, older, the older kids, it's very important that you obey your parents. It's very important that you do that which is right. Do you know why? Because you will provoke your other children to do that which is right. Just like the opposite is true as well. How many times do, do the kids disobey? They do something they're not supposed to be doing and then other kids go right along after them and they start doing the same thing. It shows you the great influence that, that a brother or sister can have on you know, one of their other siblings, doesn't it? It's very important that children we always have, whoever you are, whatever position you're in, you always have influence. Whether it be a menial, non-reputational uh, you know, sit, uh, situation that you're in, you still have influence on other people whether you know it or not. People are still looking at you and you are influencing someone's mind and their decisions that they're going to make later. In some way or another, whether you realize it, whether you can see it or not, you are influencing other people. And, and in this case, especially, even more so, brothers and sisters. Because the younger they are, their formidable years, they're more influential, aren't they? Kids are just, they're, they're, they, they'll do whatever somebody else tells them to do. They'll do whatever, especially, older brothers and sisters do. So that should be <clears throat> more of a drive to some of the older children that, hey, I don't want my, hey, even if I do something wrong, which you shouldn't in the first place, I definitely don't want my brothers and sisters doing it. So I should at least be good so that I don't lead them down the wrong path, right? So this is in all areas of life we should apply this, right? We should, not, we should strive to be a good example to others. This is the, the secondary application is what? Where do we hear about provoking others recently? Church. The importance of church. It, it, it talks about provoking others unto good works, right? Unto love and good works, it says in Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 24, right? The importance of one person provoking another person. Here in the very next chapter, what do we see? We see a brother provoking a brother, right? We see this all throughout the Bible. All throughout the Bible where one person provokes another person. Philippians chapter number one, just, some, I'm, just popped right in my mind, where Paul's talking about how his bonds embolden other people. You're constantly influencing other brothers. You're constantly you know, influencing other people that you're around. So we should come together every opportunity that we get that we might provoke each other. Amen. And we, that we might provoke one another unto good love and good works. <clears throat>
I want my, I'm, it's not only about myself, I want my brothers and sisters to do that which is right too. So I want to be here so that I can provoke you unto good works. Uh, last Monday or a couple Mondays ago, I felt terrible, right? And I was going to go soul winning. And Brother Russell was coming and then last minute, like Brother Hall sent a text like 10 minutes beforehand. And he's like, hey, I'll be, something like, I'll be, I'm, you know, I'll be there whatever time. I don't know exactly what he said, I don't remember. But, uh. It was, it was something about when he was going to be there. Then I knew he was coming. And then I went outside because I saw Brother Russell there a few minutes before that. And I went outside like limping. I was sick, really feeling bad. And Brother Russell like said immediately like, you alright? And I was like, yeah, I'm not feeling well, man. I was like, now that Brother Hall's going, I'm not going. Because I was going to go because I felt really sick. I was going to go so that Brother, I told Brother Russell, I said, I was going to go so that you still went. That was the reason why I was going to... You need to not only think about yourself. Amen. You need to not only be selfish. You need to not, you know, you need not be selfish at all. Not only be selfish. You need to not be selfish at all. You need to, see, there, this is what I meant to say. There's nothing wrong with, with thinking about your own spiritual growth and how am I doing in my Christianity. But you know what? That's not the only thing that's important. Okay? Everyone else's Christianity here is important too. Why don't you think about every, everyone else every once in a while? Stop just thinking about your own growth, your own spirituality. Think about the difference that you could make in others if you come to church. Think about the difference that you could make in others. Look for opportunities to provoke others unto love and good works. Maybe if you see somebody struggling in an area in a nice and kind way, say, hey, let's do this together. Hey, I like to do this every once in a while. You want to help me? And maybe get them to do that task or take part in whatever that is. You know, whatever it may be. Look at all your brothers and sisters that, come, that came to church tonight. Look at them and not in a way to try to demean them in your mind or look down upon them and maybe find an area where they lack and go to them in love and try to provoke them unto good works. I'm not saying go and correct them. I'm not saying go and say, hey, you need to be doing this. You're not. I'm saying go in and in some way just try to provoke them unto love and good works. Why not try to do that? That's what the church is for. That's the purpose of the church is to edify and to build one another up. This is what you should be doing. You know, if you, if you, you know, uh, right now we're kind of maxed out on space and everything as far as uh, the, the, the opportunities to participate in the musical ministry. But you know what? We can swap people out. You know, I get tired of hearing Brother Hall every time. No, I'm just kidding. You know, my daughter, we can swap out Michaela if you learn the piano. I've told Michaela that. that people that know me know I'm not a respecter of a person when it comes to my family. I told Michaela, if somebody gets better than you, you go back there. I'll let them show their gifts off. They're working hard to, for God. You then maybe you practice. You know what that would do? That could provoke her onto love and go. Hey, I want to work hard too. I want to worship God too. I want to have. If she's being lazy and not playing hard, guess what? That I'm going to give that opportunity to the person that's gifted and that's being blessed because they're working hard and they're they they're taking it seriously and things along those lines, right? And you may not even mean to provoke others. It may even just be that maybe, maybe you just not coming to church one day. You know? Maybe you just not doing what you shouldn't be doing. Whatever it may be. Maybe you just not, you know, uh, just living a clean life. Maybe somebody sees you out there. You're having an effect on other people. You're having an effect on your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're having an effect when you don't know it. So you see the importance of provoking one another unto love and good works. Brothers should provoke their brothers, sisters should provoke their sisters. We should provoke one another unto love and good works. Ja we see here that Jacob provoked Esau and he didn't even mean to, did he? Look at verse number 10. <clears throat> and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran, and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. We, we saw where when it described Esau and Jacob it said that uh, Esau was a hairy man. He's like hunting all the time, right? And then it just says about Jacob, he was a plain man dwelling in tents. It talks about him, right? You could take that the wrong way. You could, and, I, and I even said this before, their lifestyle was very different than ours in the first place. But you could take that the wrong way and think that he's maybe like effeminate or something along those lines. We see here, and this is obviously small, but we see here when Jacob is traveling, it says that he stops and he's tired and he lays down and it says that he gathers together the stones for his pillow. So this guy is obviously not, he's not afraid of sleeping outside, he's not afraid of, 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 of roughing it, right? Of going outside and just sleeping on the rocks, on the stones. That's his pillow in this case. So he's obviously not a weak, feminine person. That's obviously not who he is. 
<clears throat> According to 1 Corinthians 6, it's a sin to be effeminate, by the way. It, it, would be a, it would be a sin if Jacob was effeminate, that would be a sin. Look at uh, verse number 12. <clears throat> And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou, thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is extremely, this is what's called, known as Jacob's Ladder, right? Everybody's heard of this, I'm sure. It's an extremely interesting uh, scenario that takes place where God gives, excuse me, a dream unto Jacob. This is obviously a divine dream. And the dream is Jacob is, is on earth, of course, and there's a ladder that's set up from the earth to the heavens, right? All the way to the heavens. And there are angels ascending and descending on the ladder. So they're going up and down, up and down, right? And then God, and who is the one God? Let me say that first. But to us there is but one God, the Father. Okay, I'm getting ready to make a point, guys. Come on. So God... The one God is the Father is standing above this ladder, right? Where does man dwell? He dwells on earth, right? This is, that is the dwelling of man. Where does God dwell? In heaven, right? And then we see angelic beings going up and down, up and down, right? So what does this ladder picture? Really, what's the point of the ladder? It pictures the bridge, if you will, from man to to God. It's not a coincidence that God is standing at the top of the ladder, right? In heaven. So it pictures the bridge from man, from earth to heaven. And who's standing at the top of it? God. The Father is standing at the top of it. Is the God of here, you know, is of course Abraham and Isaac. I always want to say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because that's said so many times after that. But right now he just says, I'm the God of Abraham, you know, and, and thy father Isaac. So we have God the Father. And then we have man, we have this bridge. And the angelic beings are going up and down, right? Of course they can do that. But the bridge represents the reconciliation from earth to heaven, from man to God. The bridge, the mediation point, how you get from here to here, right? It's the way to heaven. What, is, what does Jesus say in John 14, 6? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's what this bridge represents, of course. Jesus says, even in uh, John chapter number 10, he says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He is the way to the Father. So if man who is on earth, if he ever wants to go to heaven, if he ever wants to dwell with God, if he ever wants to make it to the Lord or make it to God, you know what he has to do? He has to go through Jesus. Amen. That's what he has to do. He has to go through Jesus. He is that bridge. He is that, 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 uh, that reconciliation there. He is that mediator. He is the way. He is the only way for man to get from earth to heaven. That's the only way it can happen. And then right after this, <clears throat> uh, the Lord preaches the gospel to him, just like he preached unto Abraham. He talks to him about... Uh, he says, The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What is that? That's the gospel of Jesus. While he sees this vision of this, 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 this uh, ladder. And that's all that a ladder is. A ladder is just, it's a bridge that is going vertically as opposed to horizontally, right? It's just the way, right? So right here, and then it says, it's interesting in verse 15, he says this, And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. That's strong words, isn't it? That's a, that's a, that is a comforting promise. Amen. Look what it says next. And will bring thee again into this land. He says, I'm promising you, there's of course a literal application right then, but of course we know there's also a secondary application. He's going to bring him into the land, New Jerusalem. Look at what it says next, very interesting. For I will not leave thee. Now what's that verse, does that pop in your mind? 
Exactly. He, where the Lord says that He will not leave us. He says, I will not leave thee nor forsake thee, right? God's not going to leave us. And who is that? Of course, that not this comforting? Of course it is. And this is the comforter that's speaking to him. This is the Lord in heaven, the comforter, talking to him and doing what? He's comforting him. You know, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. So you have the one Lord, the one God standing above that ladder, right? And this is a vision that God made. So who made the ladder? God. God provides salvation. Amen. God is the one that provides salvation. Then he preaches unto him grace. He preaches unto him the gospel, and he says, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to do this. I'm, never, I'm not going to leave you. Like, the, like it says, like we were quoting a minute ago, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, right? In Hebrews 10. He, he won't leave us, right? He's preaching unto him the gospel. That's eternal security right there in a picture, right? It's very interesting because notice the Lord does all this, and there's promises... God does this. This picture is a ladder. What does it picture? What does this picture? The way of salvation. Well, if you go back, go back to Genesis chapter number 11. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 11, we have another picture of salvation. But it's not the right way of salvation. It's very, very similar. And there's, a, there's, a, there's strong similarities. It says in verse number 2, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to. Now I'm going to emphasize certain words here. I want you to pay attention. Let us make brick and burn them throughly. <coughs> and it says, And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. Now doesn't that sound like a lot of work? Right? That's like one of the most labor-intensive jobs that there, are, that there is, is masonry work. And notice he said, let us. So they're doing this. Verse 4. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So you have these two pictures. Genesis chapter number 11. You have man. And he's trying to, to, uh, to erect you know, some sort of architectural, you know, structure that is going to get him from where? It looks in this case from earth to heaven. And man's going to be building it. He says, let us do this. And we're going to be doing the work so that we can make ourselves a name. And we're going to get ourselves there, right? And then we look over in Genesis chapter number 28. And who built the ladder there? God's the one that gave him the dream. God's the one that gave him the vision. And then he preaches unto him grace, and he tells him, hey, I'm never going to leave you. You know, I'm going to be with you the whole time. He says, I'm going to bring you back into the land. I'm going to be the one that brings you there, right? So you have, a, you have these two contrasts of, and pictures of, number one, the true gospel, the gospel of grace where God does the work for us, which is the only way that you would ever be able to do it. And then over here you have the picture of works salvation. And every religion and every false denomination of Christianity falls into this category over here. And you know, uh, one of the powerful truths that come out of this figure of, of the Tower of Babel is the fact of, if, if, if you take that literal, that they're going to build a tower to heaven, what's the possibility of that? Zero. Not a chance. It's not happening. It's not, it's not humanly possible. Right? It's not possible. That is exactly the same as work salvation. It's not possible. No one will ever do it. It will never happen. The only way you're going to get there is if you climb up God's ladder that He made for you. God came down to earth and was born on this earth as a man. He lived the perfect life. He was the only one that could. And He said, I am the way. He's the ladder. I am the truth and I am the life. The only way to get there is by grace through faith. And this so much defies Ephesians 2, 8, 9 there at the end. It says, let us make us a name. Like Ephesians 2, 8, 9 there at the very end. You know, well, the whole thing says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. So right here they're saying, we're going to do it. It says not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. What are they doing? They're working. They're, you know, they're getting slime and mortar. They're building this. They you know, uh, you know, have bricks that they're assembling and manufacturing and putting them together. Right? It says, not of works. And then it says this, lest any man should boast. Lest any man should boast. They said, and let us 
make us a name. That right there defies any, any, that defies any ounce that you can ever take part in salvation. At all. Any. It doesn't matter what it, even what it is. The Bible is very clear that, that salvation, it, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be able to boast. Now, let's say this. Let's say you had to be baptized in order to go to heaven. Right? Let's say that you had to come to church in order to go to heaven. You don't have to do these things, of course. But let's say you did. <clears throat> if you accomplish that, if you were the one, let's say one time a week, you know, from the point of your salvation, you had to go to church at least once a week. Three times, no, I'm just kidding. Once a week, right? You had to come once a week for your whole life until the day that you died. And you did that. Let me ask you this question. Could you boast about it? You could, couldn't you? You could boast about that. You could say, you know, you know why? And if by works, then is it no more of grace? And it, like the, it begins. How does the verse begin? And if by grace, then is it no more of works? And it can't be any works. It's either grace or works. These two things are not possible to coexist at the same time. It's either the Tower of Babel or it's Jacob's Ladder. That's what it is. Amen. It's either, you choose, buddy. Seriously. The Catholics choose the Tower of Babel. The Episcopalians choose the Tower of Babel. Right? You know, the Presbyterians choose the Tower of Babel. Non-denoms, most of them choose the Tower of Babel. Who else? Let it set in. Anybody, right? All of those Muslims, Buddhists, they all choose the Tower of Babel. That's their way to get to God and it's never going to happen. When He, he built a ladder for them. He made the way for them. He made it possible because He loves them. And he even says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will bring you back into this land. And what do they do? Now I want to make myself a name. I want to make myself a name instead of just embracing the good news. So many people you talk to that, that are Christians, they're not saved, but they, they're, they, they're are practicing Christians, right? So many times you can tell that they get the gospel, but there's something just holding them back. Just holding them back from just, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be good news. It sh you should be happily, happily receiving it. You should be happily just embracing the fact that, and once you understand, especially, I cannot do it. It's a tower that can never be built. It'll never happen. It would never, these men could have spent their lives dedicated to building this tower. It would have never happened, ever, never when God has a ladder right around the corner. God made the ladder. He did it. And it's easy. All you got to do is just enter in at the door. All you have to do is just believe. Just trust Him. That's it. It's that simple. I love these pictures. In the, in the, you know, it's not a coincidence these are just a couple of chapters away from one another. And you have this strong picture of work salvation. And then over here, you have this strong picture of the gospel of grace. When he's preaching the gospel to him, when the Lord's standing at the top, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The one God, the Father, standing at the top. Who's the bridge? Jesus. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. It's interesting, too, because he actually mentions down there at verse 17, the very, very end, says, and this is the gate of heaven. Sounds like the door, right? This is the gate of heaven. This is the access to heaven. You know why? This, this, this dream that he's talking about, there's another application I'm going to get to this, but this dream that he's talking about, the bridge, what is it? It's, it's the gate to heaven. It's the way to get into heaven. It's, it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a coincidence, again, that he preaches the gospel of Christ to him right there after he tells him that. Look at verse number 16. It says, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. I want you to watch his reaction. <clears throat> and he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? <clears throat> this is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Notice Jacob's reaction. Now that's a man that has, the, has a right heart. He's got a godly, uh, righteous heart is what he has. Of course, none's righteous. The Bible referred to man's righteousness from, from our perspective, if you will. Talk about being blameless and things like that. He's trying to live a righteous life and he has a godly heart. Why? Because when he's confronted with God's word, when he's confronted with this vision by God, when he encounters God, do you know how he reacts? 
He says, and it says, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? That's, that's strong language. That's a very, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, intense word. How dreadful. You know what that's like? Terrible. Those are words that describe God repeatedly in the Bible. That he's dreadful and that he is terrible. We should be, uh, uh, you know, afraid of God. You should fear God. Amen. People say, I don't fear God. I love God. You know, he's my, you know, people, you know, it's just irreverent. It's, it, people, this view that people have of God today is, is totally, uh, it's a polar opposite, you know, philosophy than the Bible puts forth. God is not your, your buddy. You know, he, you, he can be your friend. But let me explain this very clearly. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is he's the God and the ruler of all. He is the God of this earth. He has, more, he has all power. He is all powerful and almighty. We should fear God. The Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. You should be afraid of God. Amen. You know what should stop you from sinning? Is the fear of the Lord. Amen. You know what? The Bible talks about uh, God when he commands the children of Israel. Hey, you mean to give you reasons to read the, the Bible, to read the law to your children that they might fear me and keep my commandments? That's why the law is so important to know and to, and to understand the law. It's because it puts the fear of God in you. And you say, how? Maybe sit your children down when they get a little bit older and start reading to them. Uh, what is it? Uh, I don't remember the exact chapter, but it's earlier on in the book of Exodus, the 20s, of capital punishment. Start reading through there. That's what that's talking about. What do you think it's talking about? That's a perfect example. You don't think that that would put the fear of God? If you as a child were living in the nation of Israel, if you were living in, you know, living amongst the Hebrews and you knew that, hey, this law is active right now, that if I'm a drunkard, I'm, this is not talking about Ryan, right? You know, or glutton. Atheists always say, like, you know, you stone a five, six-year-old kid if he's drinking alcohol. That's so stupid. It's talking about a child that will not work, a child that's a drunkard. It's talking about it's the, children at this time lived with their parents sometimes they were 30 years old. It's talking about a 20, 30-year-old kid that has repeatedly been corrected for years and years and years. He just spits in his father's face. He never does anything he's supposed to do. He's a drunkard. He's a glutton. He's stubborn. He won't listen to his father. He just basically hates his father and his mother and just treats them terribly. It's talking about like a, a very bad child, a very bad human being. You know what the punishment according to the Bible is? Put him to death. Do you know what that does to children? Puts the fear of the Lord in them. That's the God that you serve, children. That's the God that you serve, adults. That is our God. He says, hey, put them to death. Put them to death. Right? He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. Right? But he's also a God of judgment. You need to have a balance here. We need to know who God is. Not just one aspect of God. And just fixate on the one aspect that we like. We need to know all of God's character. And that's how God is. He's fearful. We should, God, we should fear God. We should have times when we read about things and be like, man, God is, God is dreadful. God is terrible. He instills terror into you. That's what that means. He will cause you to feel terror. That's a strong word for fear. That's how we should feel. That's how Jacob was extremely afraid. Can you imagine him just like shaking when he wakes up? He was extremely afraid. He said, look at it. And he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other None other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Secondary application, of course, the house of God. We were preaching about that and a lot of people have been thinking about that. And it says, and this is the gate of heaven. Makes me think about in Matthew chapter number 16 when it talks about the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And it says, the house of God and the gate of heaven. Where do the keys go to? Obviously a gate, right? Look at the importance here that it says in verse 18. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and, pour, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, <clears throat> If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace. Then shall the Lord be my God. Now I've heard preached, <clears throat> and this is a, you know, I don't even want to say it's partially right, but it's a misunderstanding of this. I've heard preached here that 
with this vow that is made, that this vow is, is, a, is, a, is a bad vow because, and I'll explain my view of it in just a moment, because he's like making a deal with God that if you do these things, then I will serve you, right? I don't view it in just that exact way, and I'll tell you why. Because God just promised to him just a moment ago that he was going to do those things for him. God just gave him a promise and said, I'm going to bring you back into the place which, where you are right now. He's, he's still in the land of Canaan and he's traveling. Bethel, the land of Luz, is what it used to be called. And Jacob actually right now is, changes the name to Bethel, right? This is Canaan, right? This is a part of the land that they're promised to be given. And he's heading to like the land of Nahor, the land of like Syria, where Abram came from, right? But if you look back at verse 15, it says, And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So, what Jacob is saying is he's vowing a vow and saying, God, if what you said is true and you do do this for me, because he just promised, right? That, hey, I'm going to bring you back into this land. And Jacob's trusting him and saying, if you're able to do all of this, right, I'm going to follow you. And if you're able to do all this, I'm going to keep serving you. Now, of course, we should not be making... That's why I said it's, it, it, there's, there's a partial truth there, but we have to make sure that we understand that we're looking at it from the right perspective. Because God just promised him something, right? God just gave him a promise, and Jacob is doing what? He's really, what he's doing is he's trusting in his promise that he gave him. Now, he says, if you do these things for me, you know, I'm going to serve you, which there's definitely some error there. But we also have to make sure that we understand the full picture of why he's saying this. He's not just out of the blue just saying, hey, if you're able to bring me back here, then I'll serve you, God. If you can do this, if you can just make sure that you, you know, keep me safe and my family safe and do all of these things and provide for my family, then I'll serve you. No, he's saying, if you're able to perform the, the, the promise that you promised me, you know, and this is the gospel, this is an unconditional promise, right? It's, it's once, at this point, there's no additional conditions. Let me say that. He's received the blessing at this point, right? He, it's, it, there are no further conditions. So he's trusting in the promise of God that God promised him. And he's saying, hey, if you, if you fulfill this, I'm going to serve you. So there's definitely an aspect you could point to error. But it's not, it's not, you don't get the full understanding of it if you just, uh, if you just say, hey, he's making a vow here in this point and um, he's just making this vow up on his own. That's not exactly what's going on. He's referring back to the promise that God promised him. So it says, uh, verse, we'll read verse 20 and 21 again. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Verse 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. We see here in verse number 22, God's house mentioned again. And of course, this is, this is a hot-button topic about the, the, the importance of church. We've been talking about the importance of church, the importance of God's house. We're told in the New Testament, Paul says, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And then he says, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So notice it says that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Amen. That's powerful. Yeah. That is powerful. Quit avoiding all of these verses that try to that try to emphasize the importance of church to you. Quit of, you know, you need to understand, you know, really the, the vast importance of the church. Matthew 16, it's referred to as it's referred to as uh, it's built upon the rock. He says, Upon the rock, upon this rock I will build my church. And then he says this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's a the, the church is built upon. The rock, which is Christ, number one. Number two, the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And number three, he says, I will give unto these, talking about and then to the church, you compare it to Matthew chapter 18 as well. He gives, talking to the church, the keys of the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, doesn't he? Then we see here in Matthew chapter number 28, we see it being likened unto a pillar, right? We see it being likened unto a pillar and a stone. And then in 1 Timothy 3, it talks about the church of God being the pillar and ground of the truth. You know what the church is? 
Tell me why I should go to church. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. Amen. And you say, hey, I don't think you should bring this up. I think you should go to church. Amen. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. That's important. Yeah. You know, you, you will never grow without the church. Right. You will never grow without the church of God. You know what you need to do? Those that have a church, appreciate the church. Appreciate the church. I'm, you know, even if you move and you go to some other church and it's not as good as this church because there's no way it can be. No, I'm just kidding. But really, if you have to move for some reason, like whatever, if it's completely necessary for whatever reason, and you find a church, appreciate that church just as much as you appreciate this church. Love your church. Appreciate your church. Love the people at the church. Love everything that the church offers. You know, when I went to my church growing up, before I ever moved to Arizona, I loved my church. Now, I'm not just saying that. In my church, I love them to death still today, but they have problems. A lot of problems. And the whole world knows about them, right? I love them to death. I love every person there, and I am extremely appreciative of my church. Before I ever even knew who that guy in Tempe is, I went to my church every Sunday morning. I went to my church every Wednesday night. I helped out for years before I ever even heard that guy's name. I, I, I loved everything about my church. Anytime there was a function, I was there. Is that true or not? Every single time. I drug my family there every opportunity I got. And then on Sunday evenings, we didn't have a service, so guess what? I drove my family. And I asked my wife the other day, what would you say? It's about 20 minutes. She's like, that was like 35 minutes. We drove, what would you say, from, from Newport, Brother Elliot? How far is uh, Bible, Baptist, and how far is? At least 20. At least 20, yeah. So you guys talk about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, so... 20 to 35 minutes. It's, it's, it's not just right around the corner. Right. right? Sunday evening, I'm in church. I love church. Amen. And you know, at that time, I was a total babe in Christ. And I had my Bible. I had you know, a local church Bible publisher. I love these Bibles. It's brought to you in part. No, I'm just kidding. But I would take notes in my Bible constantly. I, I fundamentally had a major disagreement with my pastor. But I, I respected my pastor very, very much so. And I learned things from him constantly, all the time. I loved my church. I loved my pastor. I loved the people at church. I just loved everything about church. I still love church today. Church is one of the most important things in your Christian life. Here's the thing. At the time that all the, the, the epistles were written and stuff, I understand that each individual Christian didn't have a Bible. I totally get that. But you know what the Bible still does, even still? And it's all applicable for to, to, at that time and even still to now. It uses phrases and statements about how it being the pillar and ground of the truth. That wasn't only true at that time, just because they only had the Bible. Right? It's the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what the, that's what the church is. You want the truth? Go to church. Amen. Go to church. Yeah, you can get it and reading it on your own too, but the Bible calls it the pillar and ground of the church. Don't reason with me. The Bible says that you're, you're reasoning with the Bible is what you're trying to do. The Bible says that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The Bible says that the body of Christ is necessary that you might come into being a perfect man, a full man. You know what you're going to do? You're going to show up in front of God being a half man, half a Christian. This isn't preached to, 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 to put anyone down. It's really not. It's, it's, it's being preached. You know what? If you leave here, I want you to think about this sermon. If you ever leave and go and move away, I want you to think about all the times that I talk about how important church is and never stop going to church, ever. Amen. Go to church as often as you possibly can. Every opportunity you get. Stop being a Christian that wants to find out what's the least amount that I have to do to please God. Right. Stop trying to find out just what the commandments are. Go above and beyond. Go the extra mile. Please, God. Do more for God. Stop just trying to be a mediocre Christian. Amen. I'm fed up with that attitude. Right. I didn't, you know what? We, you know, those type of Christians that just keep doing that all the time, they're discouraging the rest of the Christians. Yep. Whether it's church, whatever it is, you are discouraging other people. You are keeping them away from the pillar and ground of the truth. 
You are discouraging other Christians. Because it, it's it because it falls into all these categories. That's the reason why it's oh, it's church three times a week. So many a commandment. If it's that important to God, just go. Amen. Just go to church. Amen. You know what you're gonna be? You're gonna be the man that was given one talent and brought back one talent. That's what you'll be. Yeah. Keep focusing on just what I the menial amount that I have to do. You'll stand before God on your last dying breath with one talent. I'm going to multiply my talents. I'm going to do everything that I possibly can. I'll do more all the things, you know, all the things that maybe I read and I'm not sure if it's a commandment. I'm doing it anyways. Amen. I'll do whatever I have to do to serve God to my fullest capacity. Hey, I have my own problems. I might lack in areas, but that's my mark. That's what I'm pushing for, and I will continue to push for it. I will continue to preach that people need to push for it. Hey, I'm not telling you that you have to be here three times a week to be right with God. That's not what I'm saying to you. That's not what I'm saying. But you know what? I want to do more than what just I'm commanded. Look at the apostles. You think that they were only meeting once a month? You think that they were meeting one time a week? Read their lives, their whole entire life, every day, all day. The apostles and disciples are together all the time, constantly, yeah. breaking bread all the time. Right. Should be your best friends. Right. It's a major problem if you don't like church. Amen. There's a major problem if you don't enjoy church. There's a major problem if you walk in this door and you're like, man, I'm tired. I don't want to be here. Man, this isn't fun. Man, when's the sermon going to be over? Man, you know, I'm done with the fellowship. I'll see you guys later. Look at your heart. There's an issue there. There's a problem there. That's what's going on with you. Hey, it's not that my preaching's poor. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not the greatest preacher in the world, but... And it, 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 let, me, let, me, let me use it like this. You know, I've sat under many preachers that I would personally say that I'm a better preacher than them. And I force myself to enjoy. I don't want to put down anyone's preaching. But I, I sit there and I do not allow myself to have this crap attitude. I, when I go to church and I'm talking to people and, you know, <clears throat> it's a person that maybe isn't the friendliest person... Maybe, you know, there's a group of brothers and sisters that are fellowshipping. I try to inject myself into that. I try to, to, to make sure that I make the most of it. That's my point. In whatever situation that I'm put in when it comes to things like this, with church and pleasing God, you try to make the most of it, especially with church. That's what people don't get. You don't... If you read the New Testament and you don't understand how important church is, I, you know, you need to read it again. <laughs> That's what you need... 1 Corinthians 12 is talking about, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 12. The book of 1 Corinthians, there's a full chapter dedicated to talking about all the church members and all the things that they do. This, thing, this part of the body is necessary for this person, and this part of the body is necessary for this. You find that, Ephesians 4, you find that all throughout the Bible repeatedly, that all these things are necessary. Hey, this part of the body does this task. They're referred to as a member, you know why? Because they're doing work for the body of Christ. How many times is the body of Christ referred to? Over and over and over again. The church is one of the, one of the most vital things to your Christian life. Don't be satisfied with not coming to church. I mean, my attitude is, any opportunity that you get, go to church. Amen. Any chance that you can help the church, help the church. Amen. You know, and, 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 and here's the thing. You know, this isn't to put people down that don't go to church. This isn't to make you feel bad that you don't go to church. I realize it could do that if you don't go to church. But you guess what I want you to do? Take a big, wild guess. Go to church. That's why things like this are preached. And oftentimes, when people don't want to do the commandment that's being preached, they're like, ah, oh, you're looking down at me. You're, you're just acting like you're so righteous. And I'm not. It's like, it's like a person that lies all the time. And you're like, hey man, it's not alright to lie. Nah, you're just so righteous. Stop, you know, stop acting like you just do everything better than me. No, I just want you to stop lying. Yeah. Do you understand? You know, I'm just telling you honestly. It's like a person that commits adultery. Okay? And you go to them and say, hey, that's, that was wicked what you did. Obviously you don't. It's really sinful. It's a much bigger deal than that, right? But you go to them and you try to correct them and you're like, and they just like, you, you know, you're just saying this because you're just more righteous than I am. That's not what it is. This is the, 
you know, yeah, there's specific people that this is targeted at, but it's always the same. Every single time, it's always the same. It's always the same. Don't ever be that person. Don't ever have that attitude. It's the same. You're, it's, it doesn't even matter what topic it is. It's always the same. It's people that don't want to do more. It's people that don't want to do whatever that commandment is, don't want to ever do whatever God has for them. You know, that's what it is. People that, that are satisfied with their Christianity. You know, you know what Jesus says? You say, show me the commandment. Show me the commandment. You know what Jesus tells you how you should be as a Christian? I'll just tell you how Jesus says. He says, hey, if somebody tells you to go a mile, go twain. Amen. Amen. That's, what, that's how Jesus says that you should act. That's how, you know what? You say, uh, you know, how do you, you know, tell, show me in the Bible how I have to do this. You know the philosophy of a Christian from the Beatitudes, from the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous Christian sermons in, in all of theology in the New Testament? If someone asks you to go a mile, go twain. The attitude of the Christian truly is, should be above and beyond. Look at Paul. He's never satisfied. He said, I'm pushing to be perfect. I'm constantly pressing toward the mark of the prize, the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. He wants to be the perfect man. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get to that perfect man, the fullest man. You know what? If I have to come to, come to church six, seven times a week, I would do that. If I have to do whatever I have to do, I'm going to do that. So be it. Whatever I have to do to be the, the perfect man, that's what I'm going to do. That, you know why? Because it means a lot to me. Because I want to please God. Amen. Be pleasing to God. And you know what? Some people are going to be more pleasing to God than others. It's just a fact. You say, hey, it's not a commandment. You know, I don't have to do this. I don't have to go to church. Anything. Any, anything. Just take this in general. Because this can apply to you maybe if you go to church every, every week, every service. You try to do as much as you possibly can for God in a lot of areas. Look maybe at some other areas of your life. And check out your, your, your life and see if there's anywhere, you know, where it's, it's possible, where you're just satisfied. Where you're just content and there's no growth. That's not good. Right. Where there's no growth and you think, like, I've arrived. That wasn't Paul's attitude. Are you as good as Paul? See, some people are going to receive more rewards in heaven. Some people are going to be more pleasing to God. Everyone's not going to be equally... God isn't going to be equally as pleased with each person. Right? So just because, you know, you keep this commandment, right? And there wasn't more asked of you. Okay, I understand. Hey, I'm not saying you sin, buddy. You go to church once a week. You know, I'm not saying you're sinning by doing that. By only going to church once a week. But you know what? I want to be the man that's more pleasing to God. Amen. I'm not trying to be self-righteous. I'm just preaching to you the same attitude that Paul had. I'm not trying to tell you that, hey, I'm better than you because I want to do more. No, I'm just telling you I want to do more for God and I'm trying to compel you to do more. Amen. Stop looking at me and say, oh, you're self-righteous. No, I want you to do more. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to provoke you onto love and good works. I'm trying to encourage you to do more for God. I passionately love God and I want to do more for Him and I want to be pleasing to Him and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to one day really stand before Him and I'm going to look in His eyes. That's going to happen to you too. Okay? And I want you to think of all the vanity of your life. Think of all the vain things you spent your time on. All the, all the things that mean nothing. When you could have been doing something that would have caused him to be more pleased with the life that you lived on this earth. I'm not saying you've got to be here three times a week. I'm not saying that. I'm not telling you it's a commandment. You know, forsake not the assembly of, our, of yourselves together is a commandment. And it's ridiculous to say that that's not a commandment. He's not giving you a suggestion. Paul is saying, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. That's what he's saying. <clears throat> Brother Elliot, what if, what if I said to you, just as an example, what if I said to you, this isn't anything, I'm, giving, I'm making an example right now. I'm not like, he's getting ready to like, no. What if I said to Brother Elliot, like, uh, you know, here at the church, obviously, I said like, forsake not to do that. Would you say that that's just, would it, would it sound to you like it's just a suggestion? It wouldn't, would it? What if I told my child that? Think of this as Holy <laughs> Scripture even on top of that. Like forsake not to do that. Come on. Scripture 
you know, and even how much more so the Word of God. He's not just giving you good advice. You leave Valiant Baptist Church, understand it's a commandment to go to church. If you ever have to move, it is a commandment to go to church, to not forsake yourselves. Go to church. But don't be satisfied with a, with a, with a 50 Christian life, with 50% effort. You know, somebody asks you to, to run a mile, to go a mile with them, it says run, but go twain. Go two. Do more. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. <laughs> dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for the local church. We thank you, dear God, that, uh, that it's not a coincidence that we were in this chapter emphasizing the house of God and how it's a pillar, dear Lord, at such a time as this. We, we ask you that the word of God would provoke us and to help us to provoke others. Help us to do it in love and help us to have the right heart if we uh, have to... Uh, have to point things out maybe in people's lives, dear Lord, whatever we have to do in any area of life where someone struggles, dear Lord, help us to have the right heart about it. Help us to have the right heart if ever we, we are doing something wrong, dear God. And, and just please uh, bless our church here. Help us to be pleasing to you as individuals but also as, as a, a local New Testament church. Uh, we ask you that you would, uh, through your word, just compel us to do more for you all the time. And that we would never just stop growing, but that we would always have it in our minds. We need to do more, and we need to do more. We love you, dear Lord. Just bless us and be with us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. <clears throat>